We're going to carry on our uh, heart failure session with uh, Dr. Barry Trachtenberg again, presenting the uh, unique form or rather distinct forms of cardiomyopathy. So we'll see what Dr. Trachtenberg has to tell us. All right. Welcome back. This is sort of a hodgepodge talk. I don't know the right title. Distinct, rare, sort of rare, interesting. We'll call it interesting cardiomyopathies or the cardiomyopathies that I find interesting. So some of the diagnosis, we've seen this slide before, you'll see it at a thousand heart failure talks, but the, the, the under-recognized cardiomyopathies, looking at the infiltrative cardiomyopathies here, you see their prognosis compared to idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy is much, much worse. I want to focus on three um, cardiomyopathies of interest, um, not necessarily related to each other, but uh, cardiac amyloidosis, cardiac sarcoidosis, and giant cell myocarditis, just to really um, give you guys exposure to these three areas, and not to really necessarily be a comprehensive and, and make you experts in, in 14 minutes. So um, looking first at cardiac amyloidosis, and you guys can start the timer, or you can give me as much time as I want, and I'll add my 30 extra slides I cut out. So uh, looking at cardiac amyloidosis, there's two main types of cardiac amyloidosis. One is light chain amyloidosis, which is a disease produced in the bone marrow, uh, and it, it causes um, these uh, light chains to be misfolded and, and the fibrils get deposited in the heart and a bunch of other places as well, versus transthyretin amyloidosis, which is called TTR, ATTR, amyloid transthyretin. And this is from a, a protein that is produced in the liver as a tetramer, and then it, it becomes, um, it dissolves into these monomers and, and that, that end up also being deposited as amyloid fibrils in the heart. So, so one is a disease that starts in the bone marrow, the other is a disease that starts in the, in the liver, and uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the common, um, some, some of the common uh, manifestations. So if you look at, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, um, but, and I don't have a pointer. So if you see primary amyloidosis, um, AL amyloidosis is a disease typically in the sixth or seventh decade of life. About 50% of patients have cardiac involvement. Transthyretin amyloidosis, these are all variants of transthyretin amyloidosis. It can be either genetic, of which there are a bunch of genetic variations, or it could be the quote unquote senile or wild type. If you look at the different types of, of genetic causes, there's the Valmet formation, which is um, a common genetic uh, typically in Europe, but that causes the familial amyloid polyneuropathy with very rare or limited cardiac involvement versus the, 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 the VAL-122 isoleucine mutation, which 3 to 4% of African Americans carry that gene for, don't necessarily have complete penetrance, but it's a common one in the in U.S. And almost all cases will have cardiac involvement, and usually they don't have a lot of neuropathy, or sometimes they do, and they usually will be manifest by carpal tunnel, particularly bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. I always want to think about, if you have a patient with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, you always want to think about amyloidosis. Um, and looking at how do you, some of the screening tests for amyloidosis, so this is a blood test, the free light chain assay that just looks at the kappa and lambda, um, uh, lambda light chains, and the ratio, if you have a proliferation of one of them, the ratio will be abnormal, so the kappa to lambda, if it's a kappa, pro, pro, if it's kappa predominant, then you'll have a, a ratio that's greater than five typically, if it's lambda predominant, less than 5, 0.5 typically. Uh, SPEP, UFSPEP is a little bit less useful as an initial screen. Um, and if you have someone that's suspicious for amyloid and their ratios between that 0.5 and 5, you want to think about TTR amyloidosis. This is one of several diagnostic algorithms that have been pro proposed for someone with a suspicion for clinical um, amyloidosis. So you can get your, your start with the blood work, your light chain assays, SPEP, UPEP, et cetera, ECHO, EKG. Uh, cardiac biomarkers. If it echoes inconclusive, you can consider an MRI, which is very sensitive and specific, but if you have a high likelihood of, of, of there being amyloid based on everything else, I would not quit with a negative MRI. Um, so if you have a, a, free light chains are positive, typically those patients will get a bone marrow biopsy to look at uh, the possibility of multiple myeloma and to diagnose amyloid. If that's positive, then that will be confirmed with mass spec. If it's negative and you still have a free light chain assay that's positive or echo that's suspicious, then at that point you could consider a cardiac biopsy. 
If the free light chain assay is negative, but you still have an echo or MRI that's suggestive of amyloid, you can do further uh, uh, testing, that, uh, nuclear testing, technetium pyrophosphate. We'll talk about that in a moment. If that's positive, then you can consider blood work to see if they have the genetic variant. If, that's, if those are negative, then you can consider um, organ biopsy. This is the technetium pyrophosphate. It's non-invasive. It's a nuclear scan. It looks at the heart to mediastinal uptake of, of, the, of the agent. And if you look at the bottom, they're equivalent. If you look at the, bo the, the bottom, I'm sorry, you see the heart in red circle versus the mediastinum in the blue circle. There's a higher uptake in the heart, and that ratio greater than 1.5 is 97% sensitive and 100% specific for transside read and amyloid. This will not diagnose AL amyloid. This is for TTR amyloid specifically. It's not really known why that agent um, is specific for TTR, but it is. And um, it's great, really, for your senile patients, not senile dementia, but your senile uh, TTR amyloid patients who you really aren't going to take a 90-year-old for a biopsy because there's not much you're going to do about it um, anyways for, the, for those patients necessarily. So this is a great way to at least confirm they have amyloid and, and it might help put your treatment in, in context. This is the revised Mayo Clinic staging system for AL amyloid. Um, and you get one point for each of uh, NT, B, and P greater than 1,800 elevated troponin T and a free light chain difference of greater than 180. If you look at the staging system, if you have stage one versus stage two in the blue and yellow, your survival is, is pretty reasonable. However, once you hit stage three, your, your survival is pretty limited. And you see here a two-year survival of about 40%. This is useful uh, not only for prognostication, but considering bone marrow transplant eligibility, um, heart transplant, uh, need to pull the trigger for heart transplant, et cetera. So what are the things that you're, you're, you will see at least one case of cardiac amyloidosis no matter where you're doing your fellowship. So I want you to, and, and if you're aware of it and, you're in, and it's on your mind, you'll see a lot more than one. So you, and I'm sure you'll miss one too. So I want you to not, to miss as many, uh, miss as few as, you, as possible. So one thing, when you look at your echo, you see this echo at the bottom, very thick walls. Um, so common echo features, you'll have both biventricular hypertrophy Biatral enlargement, uh, not uncommonly, you'll have a small to medium pericardial effusions, pleural effusions, and then, of course, um, a, a advanced diastolic, diastology features. So if you look at that echo, and they're not someone that's had severe hypertensive or that has uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then you're really going to worry about amyloid. And one thing you should look at is your EKG, and if the voltage on your EKG is normal voltage or low voltage, more commonly, with that feature of that big, thickened heart, you know you're probably not looking at someone that just has LVH. So that's something I want you guys to remember. Look, intolerance to beta blockers and ACE inhibitors is, some, is, is a red flag that would make you at least consider, of, consider it. Patients that have orthostatic hypotension, uh, patients with a history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, you'll be surprised how, what percentage of those patients might have amyloid. So for ALs particularly, you want to look at patients that have nephrotic syndrome and HFPEF, uh, that have macroglossia, that have... Um, periorbital edemas or, or, or raccoonis, orthostatic hypotension and peripheral neuropathy, especially in non-diabetics. And TTR, um, also want to look at HFPEF plus carpal tunnel syndrome, um, African-Americans with HFPEF without a history of hypertension, um, and uh, a new diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in an elderly patient, and uh, low flow, low gradient AS. Uh, so there's a lot of patients that will have um, TTR, and of course, family history. So the treatment, so, so in terms of the general treatment, you know, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers aren't well tolerated. Using bioavailable diuretics such as uh, tor torsamide, bumetidine is, uh, is more helpful in these patients that might have some, some gut edema. Um, digoxin and, and dihydropyridamine and non-dihydropyridamine calcium channel blockers are contraindicated due to binding of amyloid fibrils and the risk of toxicity. So don't give digoxin to patients with amyloidosis. Amiodarone you, you should be used with caution. And then, of course, the role of AICD, and that's a whole other discussion. But, um, and then looking at the treatment of amyloid. So for AL amyloid, there's been some novel therapies in the past uh, decade, especially um, uh, bortezomib and, and other therapies that are proteasome inhibitors have really increased the survival of a lot of these patients. Nevertheless, some of these patients need a heart transplant, um, or, or, and we've been able to successfully transplant um, about 15 patients with AL amyloid and give them um, a heart transplant, ongoing chemotherapy, 
followed by a stem cell transplant to try to eradicate the disease the best we can a year after heart transplant. Most programs do it six months after heart transplant. We do it a year later. And these patients so far have had a survival not inferior to regular transplant patients. So you can take a patient with disease as bad as amyloid and they can, with, with these granted small number of patients that you're able to get to this, to advanced therapies can do well. Um, for TTR, it's very exciting. There's been no treatment for forever until um, yesterday, the FDA just approved uh, patyrsin, pat pat which is an RNA inhibitor. It's a silencer that's targeted. It's mainly, it's only approved now for, for uh, patients with polyneuropathy, but it did have some secondary endpoints that were beneficial in terms of cardiomyopathy, so hopefully we'll be able to use it in these patients. It's not clear yet. Um, and its competitor also had a New England Journal article at the same um, time last week, last month, that was, uh, had a positive finding. And then um, Tefimidus also should be expected to be approved uh, in December. So there's a lot of new therapies and hopefully we'll be able to give uh, patients therapies for amyloidosis. So I have a minute and a half to talk about sarcoid and a minute and a half to talk about giant cell myocarditis. So um, sarcoid, just the key points to remember, it has patchy involvement. So biopsy is only about 25% sensitive. There's no true gold standard for the diagnosis, although the histology is, diagno is diagnostic but you really want to try to get non-cardiac histology first if there's lymph node or, or um, pulmonary findings to go after. There's two uh, clinical criteria we'll look at, but really CMR and PET are being increasingly used and may be complementary. You can look at this picture in the bottom. You can see where the MRI is, is positive in parts of the heart, the, the PET scan is positive in those parts and more in this, uh, in this uh, example. Um, and then these are the the proposed uh, clinical criteria by the Japanese Ministry of Health and the Heart Rhythm Society. So things you want to think about, I, I wouldn't necessarily memorize these, but you want to think about the, uh, the AV block in patients. You want to think about patients with a lot of arrhythmic burden. Um, and then, of course, um, histology, if you have, that's diagnostic. And then look at MRI and PET in conjunction with the clinical syn uh, syndromes. There's never been a randomized uh, trial of, of, of placebo-controlled trial of steroids in this population. However, we do have enough retrospective data to, and observational data that shows that steroids can improve outcomes and lead to reverse conduction abnormalities and prevent LV remodeling. Of course, it depends on, uh, we think it depends on how long they've had the disease and, and um, how much scar burden they have. The optimal dose is not really well known, and there are small case series and extrapolation of data from non-cardiac sarcoid um, that suggests uh, methotrexane and imuran and other drugs can be particularly helpful as steroid, uh, steroid sparing agents. And then lastly, another disease that's rare, but the one that's really important for you guys to keep in mind, not just for those two board questions, but also for those two patients you might have over the next few years that have this disease that you could save their life if you have a little knowledge about it. Um, so, the, so giant cell myocarditis is, is a rare and fatal immune-mediated disorder. The largest series now is uh, over 20 years old from Cooper and Leslie Cooper, New England Journal of Medicine. But it describes from a worldwide um, registry 63 cases. The mean age was 42. Uh, most of these patients presented with heart failure. During the course of their illness, about half will have refractory VT. 5% uh, will have complete heart block. And then very interesting, uh, uh, almost one in five of these patients will have another autoimmune disorder. Uh, particularly inflammatory bowel disease was common. So you have to think about someone with heart disease with other autoimmune diseases. It should be on your radar, uh, especially for a patient that comes in with acute heart failure that's crashing and burning. The median survival without transplant or immunosuppression is, is very limited at several months. Um, and you can see um, here, this is, you know, why we biopsy patients for a large degree is to look at giant cell myocarditis. And, and if you have a high index of suspicion, doing a repeat biopsy can increase your sensitivity. And a really key point to remember is that if you treat these guys with high-dose steroids, which most people do, according to the literature, that doesn't give you a survival benefit unless you couple that with other immunosuppressive therapy, so, such as cyclosporine, imuran, or antithymocyte globulin. So really, that's, that will be a board question very possibly. So steroids alone offer no benefits. You have to couple steroids with another immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, but these patients are very, very sick, high likelihood of dying, um, and really, you, these patients benefit from mechanical support, oftentimes biventricular support while you're trying to bridge them to transplant. And these are the indications for biopsy, um, and the one, two, and three are really based on um, fulminant myocarditis and giant cell myocarditis and, and sarcoidosis. 
Um, and so you want, really want to consider biopsy someone with new onset heart failure less than two weeks duration um, it, or two to three weeks with, uh, with, uh, with AV block or any signs of high degree AV block, et cetera. And then of course for amyloid restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy, et cetera. And really if you guys want to know everything about all the different types of cardiomyopathies, this is a great compendium from Circulation Research in 2017. And uh, it really, it's a great resource if you guys want to look at dilated cardiomyopathies, inflammatory cardiomyopathies, restrictive hypertrophics. Um, it's a, a, great, uh, a, a great educational piece. Sorry for the whirlwind tour through some rare cardiomyopathies, but thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh